Hi friends, I'm so glad you could be with me today as we're in God's Word together in the Unfolding the Word series. We're in the midst of Daniel. We've been getting into the first chapter, beginning to learn more about Daniel and his era, and setting the stage for all of the amazing lessons that we'll encounter in these first six chapters of Daniel. Today I want to read in the first chapter two verses that are linked together. In verse 5 we read, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time were to stand before the king. Then jumping down to verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food, or with the wine that he drank. And therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. I hope as we've been getting into this, you have an increased understanding of the wonder of this particular period of time as Daniel and his three friends, young teenagers, 12 to 15, somewhere in that age category, find dramatic transformation in their lives. In the defeat of Judah at the hands of Babylon as a discipline from God, uh, the people, these young people are taken off as the most promising of the youth for the future of leadership in Judea. They're taken off as exiles as slaves, essentially, to Babylon, ripped out of their homes, resettled into a new culture, forcefully indoctrinated, given new and ungodly names that they had to be called from that point on. And we talked already about what would all of this do to you if you were a young teen seeking to follow the Lord. And we also have seen the effect in Daniel was only a deepened confidence and trust in God despite the pain and despite the hurt of all of these dramatic changes in his life. Well, Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are now on the, on the very beginning point of the three-year training and indoctrinating program that is supposed to equip them ultimately to serve the hated king. Remember, the goal of that program was to transform the worldview of these people, to break the old loyalties, to make them committed now to the king and to the future and power of the empire of the Babylonians. There was another thing going on here, too, and that is that, that the king was requiring that Daniel and his friends do something that actually conflicted with God's laws. Now, let's continue our study and see how they were dealing with these potential conflict areas. And I want to begin our study by building on what we've already looked at and saying this. To me, it is significant what Daniel did not see as a conflict and then what he did see as a conflict. You understand what I mean? In order to understand what was a conflict and what wasn't a conflict, truly a conflict, we need to understand something more of the nature of the training that they were being forced into, this three-year intensive apprenticing and training and nurturing process. Let's look at each piece of it. The first part, according to the verses, is that the first part of the three-year indoctrination training development process was to give language study to these people, Daniel and his friends. The Babylonian Empire crossed many former national boundaries. It incorporated many diverse language groups. If someone was going to be effective in the service of the king of the Babylonians, they needed to be fluent not only in their own native language, but also fluent in the Babylonian language and in the language of many of these other regions now incorporated under the iron fist of the Babylonian Empire. There's no way to get that sort of fluency in a language short of hard work. And so three years of time was being given over to creating multilingual people. That was part of it. Part of it, it tells us, is that they were introduced to the philosophy and religion of the Babylonians. What's that about? Well, it's critical that if you're in training to serve Babylon, you needed to have a good grasp of what Babylon believed, what their belief system was all about, what religious system they had, which was very diverse, polytheistic. You needed to understand that 
And you needed to have a pretty good grasp of comparative religion. You needed to know, in order to serve the king, what the dominant religions were in the other parts of the empire, areas that had been conquered by Babylon. You don't learn such things overnight. <laughs> and so there was an extended three-year process of acquainting them with the essence of the Babylonian religious and philosophical views and comparative religious study on other things. It also indicated here that they were being trained in economic and political perspectives. If you're going to serve the empire and serve the king properly, you need to understand economics. You need to understand how politics work. You needed to understand how negotiations work. You needed to understand diplomacy and so forth. And the only way to get that was some on-the-ground training so that you became an astute person. That's what was going on. The passage also tells us that they received training that involved exposure to the occult. Why? Because they were trained to be part of the Magi order, an order later on that we discover Daniel was put at the head of because of his faithfulness to God, not because of the support of the rest of the Magi. At <laughs> any rate, that training for the Magi involved a certain amount of understanding and training in astrology, in divination, in future foretelling, uh, signs, and so forth. Uh, and so Daniel and his three friends had to be exposed to that too. They didn't have any choice about it. They had to become astute in understanding all of that complicated picture of things that the Magi order, the most respected order in the empire, believed and practiced. By the way, there's no indication in the book of Daniel, uh, not just not only in the book, but also what we would know of Daniel's life, there's no indication he practiced what the Magi believed about such things, but he had to understand what they believed about such things. Now, at what point did Daniel find himself compromised? In other words, let's put it a different way. At what point did Daniel feel, I've got to draw the line, I can't do that. And no matter what the cost, I'll draw the line here. If it means my life, it means my life. Where did he draw the line? And to me, it's exceedingly significant where he didn't draw the line. What do I mean? He didn't draw the line over the we'll call it secular curriculum. <laughs> he felt before God a clear conscience that he could study and critique and not be swayed by all of this worldview stuff he was getting exposed to in terms of language and philosophy and religion and economics and political science. He wasn't worried that that would conflict him with God's truth because to be exposed to it didn't mean to adopt it. So the secular curriculum was not the problem. And notice part of that curriculum was the Magi material, which was occultish in nature, idolatrous in nature. He knew he could be exposed to it and not adopt it. It reminds me, by the way, of Moses in Egypt, where we're told that he was exposed to all of the learning of Egypt, which had many similar components. And yet he was not adopting those beliefs. Or Paul, who had a broad education beyond the Pharisees, a broad education in Greek and Roman uh, doctrines and philosophies and religions. Uh, God, he was exposed to those things under God's plan, but he, didn't, he was not forced by the exposure to become an adopter of these other truths. So he didn't draw it on the curriculum question. And by the way, he also didn't draw it on the broader question of, will I end up helping this hated empire? You know, this forced preparation to serve the king? He saw nothing conflicting with his faith in the Lord in serving this secular government. Isn't that amazing? I think of that like Joseph in Egypt. <laughs> you remember, he was serving Pharaoh but in so doing set the stage to provide in, during the period of famine for the people of God. Or Nehemiah, serving at a future period under the Persian Empire, serving his God and also serving the secular ruler. No conflict. 
No conflict over the secular curriculum. No conflict over the forced prep to serve the hated secular government. So where did the conflict arise? And of course, you know the answer because I read the verses to you. Uh, the conflict arose over the dietary question. Join me tomorrow as we investigate knowing when and where to draw the lines. God bless.